Hey, everybody. Morning, Doc. Hey, Doc. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hmm. Busy, busy day. So Clemens, how are we, how is Germany doing in terms of uh, opening back up? My machine was muted. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> if you did answer the question, I didn't hear you because you're muted. Yes, I had my speakers muted completely. So, um, yeah. Hi, guys. Hello. Hey. Mike, are you there? Hey. Hello. And Tommy? Yo. <laughs> Thomas, are you there? I'm here. Hello. Hi. Hey, Clemens, while we're waiting, um, I'm getting ping from the CNCF folks who are running one of the conferences in Japan. I don't remember which one it is. <clears throat> Actually, it may not be CNCF, maybe it's a Linux Foundation one. I don't know. One of the guys, they keep pinging me, asking me whether we want to do a maintainer session. Um, and obviously, it's the usual thing. You know, there's a deep dive and, a, and an intro. I was thinking about saying yes and just... Um, just doing the intro that we were thinking about doing for the KubeCon EU. Yeah. Um, if it's if it ends up being at a time slot that you can make, do you want to present? If you can't, that's fine. I can do it myself. But I'm just wondering if you wanted to be considered to to present if it if the time zone if the time slot works for you. So that is all. That's all virtual. I believe so. Yes. Uh, yeah. Then Japan should work for me because I mean uh, they are they're not so far off and. Uh, I mean, if they put it into the afternoon, that will certainly work. Okay, cool. Just wanted, I thought I would just want to double check. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Colin, are you there? I am. Yeah, excellent. Hello. And Eric. Hello. Hello. And Ginger. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Yo, um, Doug. Yo, Mark. <laughs> uh, Medias, are you there? Hello. Matthias. Hello. Matthias. Hello. Matthias. I apologize. I'm horrible. Um, Manuel. Yes. Hi. Hello. Do, 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 do. Mr. Scott. Negative. I have a meat popsicle. You have a meat? Oh, what is it? I got to know. No, I am a meat. Oh, come on. Oh, <laughs> I thought you were eating like bacon or something. No, I'm quoting um, the fun movie. I apologize. I'm not hip. <laughs> uh, did I forget anybody? I think I got her. Oh, Brian. Here and also not hip and slightly confused now. <laughs> okay. Uh, Doug, it's going to be one of those days. I can tell. I just, uh, it's, it's always been a long day for me. Ahmed? Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hello. This isn't your first time on the call, is it? No. I didn't think so. Okay, good. I should have your uh, affiliation then already. All right, one more minute and then we'll get the show on the road. Oleg, are you there? I'm here. 
Hello. Uh, someone else went flying by. Ah, Lance, you there? Yep, just here. All right, cool. I'm also here, Klaus. Ah, oh, Klaus, I don't know why I keep missing you as you sneak in there. It's not the first time that's happened. But welcome. And Jam, are you there? I am. Excellent. Do, 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 do. All right. A couple more seconds, then we'll get started. Oh, Ryan, are you there? Yes, good morning. Good morning. And Tim, are you there? Yeah. I'm Hello. pretty sure I misspelled it. Oh, I was close. Here we go. T I H O M I R. Got it. All right. Three after. Let's get this show on the road. Um, let's see. 23. Okay. Um, skipping the AIs for now. Community time. Anything from the community people would like to bring up that's not on the agenda? All right. SIG update. No update as of right now. If anything happens there, I'll let you guys know. Um, SDK call. So we do have a call after this one. Uh, just to let you guys know who would normally join that. I don't believe Slinky is going to be able to join us, just so you guys know. I think some of the issues may revolve around him. So those would have to wait. Um, but we can still see what's on the agenda. All right, workflow. Timur, would you like to give us an update on anything exciting going on there? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, we decided Manuel and, I, Manuel and I would switch. So yeah, Manuel, go ahead. <laughs> so, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, we, we can alternate on that. So yeah, uh, we got a repo from the CNCF. That's nice, but we're still waiting on the Sandbox uh, final decision of becoming a Sandbox project. Uh, we also had another Primer call last Monday and we have our next community call uh, next Monday. So uh, gently reminder to that. <laughs> okay. well. All right. Any questions for those guys? All right, moving forward then. Okay, before we jump into issues and PRs, is there anything hot on the agenda that I forgot to add? People wanna mention. All right, in that case, a um, couple of hopefully smallish PRs. I believe this one's mine. I just noticed that subscriber or event subscriber is actually not used in the spec right now. This is in discovery. So I just wanted to do a little cleanup and remove it. Obviously we can add it back in if we do want to talk about it at some point. Any comments on that? Okay, any objection to doing that? All right, thank y'all. Sorry, okay. uh, oh, wasn't that added because of one of the other, uh, like the discovery doc? Well, it's in the discovery doc. That's, what I, oh, that's where okay, I was okay. pulling it from. You, you're okay with that, Scott? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, cool. As I said, we could always add it back in later. All right, add pointers to CE. This one, I believe, is strictly syntactical in nature. Um, actually, I'm sorry. This actually does two things. Um, this cleans up, actually, this is kind of odd. Oh, I see what I did. I apologize. Yeah, so for the most part, what I was doing here was on certain terms, I added a pointer to the Cloud Events spec. If it's a duplicate definition from that spec, um, I tried to make sure the text is the same, but I also um, added language here that talks about how um, if it is copied from that other spec, if for some reason there's a difference between the two definitions, the Cloud Events spec takes precedence in terms of the definition. And the reason this jumped out at me is weird is I forgot, I actually did some reordering of the terminology itself. I decided to, rather than the ordering that was there, which looked a little bit random to me, and I apologize if it wasn't, but it looked that way to me. I tried to make it in the order of from the server back to the client's perspective. So you start out with service and then source, producer, intermediary, consumer kind of thing, just to get a little bit of a flow there for, uh, I thought, better understanding. But I think that's about it. Now oh, I had to fix the link checker to, to catch that new this funky formatting thing. I don't think there's any semantic change in here. It's more syntactical, mainly just adding these little pointers to the Cloud Events spec. Any questions or concerns about that? Any objection to approving? Okay, thank you. 
This one, <clears throat> I actually should apologize for this. I should have actually done this before we merged the other PR for the provider service change. Um, this actually just goes through the rest of the spec and gets the other uh, provider usage, usages and converts them to service. Um, strictly syntactical change, I believe. I don't think I did anything with semantic change unless I just really screwed up and messed up. Any questions or concerns about that? Any objection? Okay, thank you. All right, um, okay, just wanted to bring this to your guys' attention because Slinky pointed or pointed me yesterday to mention he did update this uh, PR. Um, I think he updated it a couple of days ago though, 23rd. Yeah, so fortunately it's been there, yeah, I guess three days ago. So technically it could be reviewed and, and, and voted on today, but I don't think anybody noticed. <laughs> so I wanted to bring it up to everybody's attention today to take a look at this when you get a chance. This is a change I believe in the cloud events space. Um, just wants to add a streaming proposal for Jason. So take a look at it when you get a chance. Um, we'll talk about it on a future call. Obviously, if you have questions or comments, go ahead and mention it in the PR itself. Okay, but he's not on the call to take any questions, but I guess if someone wants to raise one right now, you're welcome to and maybe someone else can answer it. Okay, so that was just an FYI kind of a thing. All right, Clemens, since you weren't here to introduce your spec, is there anything you'd like to say here on this PR? Because I think there are just some outstanding things that need to be resolved first before we could consider merging, right? Outstanding yeah, I, yeah, yeah, there are, there are so I'm, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm expecting there to be a few more rounds of discussions and I've refrained from updating the documents um, before this call because um, there are outstanding questions and it's, uh, I, want, I didn't want to overwrite them. Um, with you know then you know it's easy to lose track on github once you do significant changes so mm -hmm. i want to so i acknowledge i acknowledge things that where i'm going to make changes with you know thumbs up and um uh, most many of yours and then i made some some further comments um so um yeah this is what this does is in fact it takes the proposal that i wrote up in the issue and turns it into a, a proper document um and really what this is, it's a somewhat smarter version of a plain um, um, file store, if you will, for schema documents. So the idea is that schema documents are typically uh, text, text documents. Some schema formats may be by, but they're uh, of the rarer kind. And um, this basically has a structure where you have a schema group, um, which is a a organizational bracket around a set of schemas that are typically belonging to an application or to a particular um, topic. Um, and the reason why the schema group exists, um, we're deriving this from, from so this, this, this proposal doesn't come from thin air. Um, we actually thought about um, uh, implementation pretty hard. Um, so the schema group exists effectively as the top level um, um, grouping for um, creating access control um, and also to um, create you know a notion of separation in a global registry um, for applications and potentially even tenancy um, and then inside of that schema group we have um, schemas um, and schemas are um, they can be concrete. So uh, there, I have a note in here at, at the start, and we should go probably go and, and take a look at the note first. Um, I have this, if you go scroll a little bit further down, there's this note. Um, so there are two ways, and I've implemented effectively both of those ways in this proposal, and they can go together, um, but we can also just opt for one, um, where either there's two ways to look at a schema you can go and look at the schema as a concrete document and basically have a schema for i'm going to make this um let me make this concrete you have a schema that is for storage event um avro 
So then you have effectively an Avro schema document and that Avro schema document is being stored in versions um, as it is. Um, and that's the simple, the simple way of, of dealing with this, where you um, just store effectively under a schema group, you score, store a schema and the schema has a particular, is for a particular format, and then you version that. The other way of doing this, and that's also in here, is to say, to be truly RESTful. And RESTful really means that the representation, that you can have an entity and the entity can have multiple representations. So the entity is really an abstract concept where you have an event of some, or the body of an event in our case, of some sort. But that body of an event can really is an abstract data, data structure and that data structure can now be rendered in multiple ways. So it can be rendered in JSON, it can be rendered in XML, it can be rendered in Avro, it can be rendered in protobuf. And so schema in that, in that view really represents the abstract um, data structure. And so instead of of managing documents, you're really managing, rep managing the schemas that define the representations of that abstract data structure. And the abstract data structure is the thing that gets versioned here. So the abstract data structure is something that exists not in this registry, but exists effectively as a document somewhere else. And here you're just managing the, 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 the schemas that belong to it. Um, so, so in that way, so in that in that in that world, um, and this is case one here, it's a truly it's a restful service in the sense that you can go and apply um, multiple schema documents, which means multiple representations or or meta meta de, meta descriptions effectively of a data structure under the same version, where you simply are doing a put. Um, on the version number um, with a content type of, um, you know, for the appropriate media type for the JSON schema, the appropriate media type for an Avro schema, the appropriate media type for an XML schema, and all of those under the same version describe the same exact same data structure. So that you can, you can then from a, um, if you want to go and fetch an Avro schema, you walk up to the, uh, if, um, uh, URL, and then you submit the accept header uh, as you're doing an, an HTTP request, where you say, these are the schemas I'm willing to accept here. Um, and then, um, you know, by your order of preference, you're going to get the best matching schema back. And then you know what serializer you need to, you need to load so that you know, everybody can go and understand the, um, the respective uh, message. So that's, that would be the truly restful way of, of, of making a, um, a schema registry, but it's a little bit more complicated. So what I'm trying to do here is to you know, satisfy this a little bit more esoteric desire for having the ability to, to represent a abstract data structure in multiple ways, but kind of uh, in, in multiple formats and store the schemas um, all alongside under the same version, version number, and also satisfy the much simpler need of just storing you know, a sequence of documents um, that are describing effectively just one format all, all together. And we're still debating, so on, in Microsoft, we're still debating on, on which of those two choices are the, is the right one. And so I just included those in this write-up to um, you know, drive the discussion and to say you know we can we can do both we can do the simpler thing, um, and uh, so kind of with that introduction of of what the motivation here is that's what I would like you to uh, you know, to use as an intro to go and read that document and see whether that's whether the the more complicated the, the super restful way is um, um, far too complicated for implementation because that's ultimately what what the 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 make or break here is, is whether that mechanism, whether the mechanisms that are described here are, you know, practical, uh, practical for, for implementation. What I don't have, what I didn't put in here are hard, are too many hard rules. So for instance, 
when you are creating a new schema, you can basically just come and, and it, it come to this registry and under a schema group, you can do a post um, or sorry, you can do a put with just a schema name and then um, a new a new schema basically or you, actually you can do a post under the schema under a schema group with a new schema um, and then and then it will go and and uh, create the, the 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 first version for you and then you can go and walk up to that same schema node and you can go and post a new version and it will go and create a new version for you and will store the latest version under that new and under that new um, uh, schema number uh, under that new version number. And if you do a get just under that schema name, you're going to get the latest version. So there's a fairly simple way of doing those things. You can now in an implementation, you could enforce, start enforcing rules and have some configuration on the back end that says, well, if you're adding a new version of a schema, then the configuration says that you have to be backwards compatible with the prior one. Right, that's some schema registries have those capabilities that, you know, you store an average schema and then you store the next version of the average schema and then there's a policy in the background that will enforce that that compatibility is there. It, that's allowed here and there's even a, um, you know, there's a ex explicitly in the in the accompanying um, um, open API definition that you can then go and return a 409 conflict and say, you know, that's not for us. But the schema registry per se, this definition here doesn't say what that should be. Doesn't, doesn't say what those rules should be because the rules can be different depending on what the format is. And it's also not constraining which formats you can store. So you can do this for Avro, you can do this for Protobuf. And if you have some um, other schema formats, um, including XML or something else that you want to go and store the store in here, that should also work. So that's the goal of this is to really have a, a very, very open base spec that can accommodate whatever schemas you like. And then um, potentially in an implementation node, um, you can go and constrain that further and say, you know, here's my, my Avro lens on this. So that's the idea behind that specification. So goal is to have a universal interface for a simple as possible, but then as flexible as possible schema registry that everybody can easily implement. Okay, and John, your hands up. Yeah, so uh, Clemens, are you, when, when you're talking about supporting, you know, multiple, uh, multiple content types, are you, like, how is that being managed? Like, are they, are you saying that I'm going to build the protobuf version of the schema and the Avro version of the schema and the JSON version or whatever, and it, the registry is just going to accept those and assume that they're the same? Yes. So, right. so that you, you're going to, so if you want to have multiple representations, then you're going to walk up to the registry and basically just store them under the same, under, under the same um, version. So any incompatibilities or things like that, when you're talking about you know, multiple versions and mm -hmm. skew between them, right? So if I update the protobuf one and now it's ahead of the other ones, like how do I, how is a consumer going to even know that? Um, because you ought to be disciplined when you, do, when, you, when you do this. So there's no, I'm, I'm not, this is just the interface and you can go and put, lo you can put logic at the back which basically says, which basically evaluates the the. Let's go. Let's say you you emit a you have you add a protobuf spec, and the protobuf spec is now the first spec that is under version three. And now you're adding an Avro spec, that is also under version three. It's basically, you're putting you're putting a new one. Then you can obviously create some logic at the back in in a particular implementation that goes and, and basically creates a projection of what the Avro of the data structure that the, that the uh, protobuf spec describes, and then checks that against the, the um, structure that the Avro um, uh, spec describes. And if there are mismatches, you can go and reject that. So there's, it's, it's perfectly possible to do logic at the back, which goes and, and matches all those things. 
but I'm not demanding here in this in this specification that um, you have to do this. So this can be as simple as um, a file store that is more or less implemented some logic that that's that's being put on top of a blob store. So then, I, then, then, given that, uh, I'll take the rest offline. But given that, relative to this spec, you should call out that that you know this distinction that you're making of the spec versus you know these other logical um, quality of service kinds of issues in, mm -hmm. in terms of managing that uh, you know in in some commentary or something because yeah that that <laughs> that's obviously a key issue in terms of the implementations and the consumers. Yeah, I've, I've, I think I've mentioned some of that in the document. Now I'm, I'm, I'm relying on Doug to scroll, so I should probably not do that. Um, where, where do you want me to go? Uh, yeah, see, that's, that's um, um, I need to go look myself. Hang on. Um, give me a moment. Is it this multi-format section? Yeah, I, th I have, I made some imp implementation reference. Um, so, uh, so this emo in under version uh, in the, at the, um, in the intro, um, even though prescribing the specification and implementation might choose to impose compatibility constraints on versions following initial version of a schema, for instance, so that I'm, I'm already calling that out there. Uh, and then we have some of that in the um, um, also from access control for access control rules. I'm also making a comment. Implementations of the specification may associate access control rules with schema groups. Um, there was a comment that we should also go and uh, um, allow that for um, schemas themselves, so for versions potentially. Um, and um, So I've ma I'm, I've made I've made references to implementations in several places. So if you um, if you have suggestions for where it should be stronger, then I will, I'm certainly certainly willing to go and and make that stronger. Okay, uh, Ryan, I think my hand was before you, and I have a quick question. Um, so so Clemens, I, I like the fact that for the most part you're describing this as just sort of a blob store with a nice file interface on top of it. Yeah. And, and leaving the semantics up to either an implementation choice or if they want to do nothing at all, that's great. But then when you start talking about the version stuff, that's when I start getting a little confused because yeah. um, that's almost adding semantics. I'm wondering why you just don't say, okay, each, you know, this particular user, they own this maybe URL and, or this URL group, and then they could put whatever they want there, right? If they choose to use, if they only choose to have one URL and they just keep updating that one version every single time, that's up to them. If they want to have multiple versions, it's up to them. They just change the URL that, that they do a put to. I'm wondering why you decided to add semantics around versioning. Um, because for, that is really to accommodate the simple case where you don't care so much where you really only what you have like, like you have a schema and then you want to go and store the schema and then you change the schema changes and you just store the new version of the schema under the same name. Um, so th there's no compatibility rules. Um, you're okay with breaking changes, but then you want to have differentiation between the stuff that you have, have already sent, which means now you have a, a, a um, you know, ultimately you're, you're walking up to the registry, you're posting your schema, what you're doing, what you're doing is you're 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 doing a post. You're getting a um, a, a URL back. That is the URL that you're going to use and give to everybody, and that is going to that is going to have the version number, right? And now you're going to walk on up to the same to the same name, and you're posting the new version of the schema, and you get another URL back. That is the the permanent URL, the permalink, basically to that to that new schema. And you're okay with breaking changes. That that versioning, right? Of of you know just posting the new version, um, that is making things for the simplest case for the simplest case arguably simpler because I'm not even forcing you into thinking the the you know the, the management of versions. You basically just get a consecutive stream of history of those of those versions one two three four five just numbered through. You don't need to think about semver. You don't need to think about all, any of those other things. And as soon as you start 
as soon as you start thinking about the, as soon as you make the version management explicit, uh, arguably things get, get harder for the simple case. Okay, I hadn't I had thought about that simple case you were thinking about. I thought they would they want to manage the versioning numbers themselves, but okay, I understand. Uh, Ryan, your hands up. Yeah, um, I, I know I made a bunch of comments in the, in, in the PR and I haven't followed up on uh, on all of your responses, Clement, so I'll try to do that this week. But um, I, I think one big question that I have is like, how how standalone do we envision this being? I know this is starting with some cloud events, but I've seen other folks come in from other groups um, interested in some kind of common schema registry. Um, and I ask that because um, just just in, in my experience building you know very generic you know platforms or, or, or services, um, it's sometimes useful just to have like a diverse set of use cases just to test the design against. So mm -hmm. I was just curious as to what um, how you're thinking about that and and how generic you uh, envision this being. So, so I certainly envision this, envision this uh, to be broad, broader than just the cloud event payload, um, because ultimately this describes a it, it's a it's a complement complementary capability to any serialization framework, um, where you need to have where you need to share schemas between two parties, and that's true for all of messaging and eventing. Um, so this can compose with AMQP, this can compose with MQTT, this can compose with cloud events, this can compose with effectively anywhere where you need to have, where you exchange schematized data, including HTTP transfer. So that's how broad I see it. Um, and, um, and that's also because we have this, because it's, it's hard in cloud events and, and generally, um, it's hard to draw the line because what we're doing, especially with cloud events and with the, with, the, with the transport bindings that we have, we're intentionally blurring the lines between you know, what eventing is and what, and what message transfers are in, in general. Like you have, a, you have an MQP message and the MQP message can take on a cloud event character because you're just adding the, the cloud event um, attributes to it. Um, but it runs for a normal message broker. So it's hard to, to draw the line there. So I see that here as a, as a spec that is, is generally applicable or that mechanism is generally applicable um, for, um, for messaging in, in, in general. Okay. okay. And, that's, Any other and that's also, that's also let, me, let me just add one, one mm -hmm. more thing. That's also why I think the, the, this is just for the payload and then this actually hook, this this is gets integrated um, or complemented by the discovery mechanism, and where the discovery mechanism really is, that's the catalog of the the events that can be emitted that talks about all the various properties of cloud events, and then this here is really about the 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 schema that we leave out of cloud events intentionally, and that is the pay, that is the payload. Okay. And any other questions or comments for Clemens? Okay, thank you, Clemens. And everybody, please, when you get a chance, if you haven't already, please read through it and leave your comments in the PR so Clemens can try to address them offline. All right, thank you, everybody. Next up, uh, Jem, would you like to chat about your protobuf? Sure, I was rather hoping Clemens could use up the whole 50 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure he could if you, if you if you ask him to. I'm sure he'll talk about the, uh, the difference between eventing and messaging. <laughs> we want to hear. Okay, so um, I've tried to address some of the the commentary. I know Evan Evan have made a lot of comments, which I appreciate, uh, and I think I've tried to address. Um, I having had that conversation, um, I th I think a few points have come up um, and something that I'd like to toss out to the group. So um, the issue of gRPC has been raised. Um, and I, yes, that definitely needs to, if we're going to support that, it needs to be a different document. But do we consider gRPC to be a transport? I guess that's a question. Um, I think I, I'm interested in Clemens' view on that, because um, it, it 
doesn't really smell like a transport to me, but I could see arguments why we should have, you know, um, a spec that might show, you know, gRPC endpoints to carry cloud events. Uh, that's a, a, a question out to the, the group, if anyone has any opinions on that. It doesn't necessarily affect this spec, um, but it's just something to think about. Um, another question that came up was around the representation of timestamps that I'd used. Uh, and, and Doug, it might be easier to switch over to the, the actual proto spec rather than the markdown on this. Um, um, you mean down here? What? Wait, yeah. This, this that, right here? Yeah. So you can I would actually view it? Yeah. Okay. There you go. Let me um, know where you want me to go to. Okay. So that, that'll do. Um, okay. So uh, when I originally put this PR together, um, I would just represented all the attributes as a map. Yeah. Um, much like Avro does. Um, and I was sitting there mulling over whether that was a particularly idiomatic way to, to do stuff um, in Proto. So I then switched over to this other representation where, you know, I you know, explicitly listed the required and optional, um, you know, attributes as they're defined and then left them essentially a map for any, um, any additional or extensions. Um, I'm now toying with going back to the other representation, uh, the, the issues of, you know, how durable does this become? You know, I, this now would be something that would only work for V1. Yeah, you know, if we had ever added a new required um, field, you know, or attribute, then, you know, would that indicate, you know, a new version of this um, schema? Um, so, I'm toying with the idea of just going back to a straight map of, of attributes um, and not formally representing them. Uh, the question around timestamps um, was, uh, and part of this I think was my sort of speedy reading of the, the spec originally. Um, I'd read the spec to me, you know, the, from a cloud event perspective, that a timestamp had to be sort of, um, completely represented including a time zone yeah so i used a native proto type for that um, but somebody pointed out to me that the spec actually indicates that the time stamps need to be sent as a um, an iso string yeah um, and i just wanted to make sure that that was that, and that's what the spec says i just want to make sure that's what people thought it should be um because it, it again um to me you know if we have an idiomatic way of sending a timestamp i i'm not sure in in a particular format like this why um, i wouldn't just be able to use a, a formatted you know a predefined type for that um the other questions i've seen were around uh, my the way i'd address the data aspect um where I'd sort of allowed it to carry, you know, a protobuf message um, or, you know, textual data or binary data. Now, as my, again, my understanding from reading the spec is that this is sort of allowed in the spec. The spec allows for different, you know, representations. Yeah. And in fact, in, you know, in the JSON schema, we allow a JSON object to be data um, in the Avro schema, I think we allow uh, an Avro uh, record, is that the right term, to be uh, data. So again, for me, this was more idiomatic. If I have a um, event payload, which is actually you know, defined by a proto schema, um, it's much more idiomatic for me to just inject that you know, explicitly as a proto object you know, rather than externally marshalling it into a string just to be able to jam it into, you know, the, or you know, marshal it into bytes to be able to then jam it into, you know, um, a byte buffer inside another proto object. It just didn't seem very efficient to me. Um, so that's 
that's really where I stand at the moment. As I said, I'm probably going to go back and switch you know, um, the attributes back to a simple map um, where, and again, following the model, if we scroll down a bit more, Doug, um, where I'd sort of come up with this model of allowing all of the um, types that we define in Cloud Event to be sort of formally carried in Proto without losing any of their type information. So, you know, if you had an attribute that was a URI, you know, you would put it in a URI um, name. And so the receiving end would know that that attribute was actually a URI. And similarly for booleans and, and timestamps and whatever. So that's really where I am at the moment. Um, uh, questions? Yeah, so uh, Mike, your hand was up first. And then Clemens, I'll go to you since you came off mute. But Mike. Yeah, sorry, I, I had to rewind a little bit. Um, so the question was using a map versus having these types in Proto. Um, having these types the way they are now is the right way. Using a map to define the attributes would not be protocol buffer idiomatic. Um, you know, adding, adding new fields to and versioning Protos is a well understood thing, at least internally at Google. Um, we do it all the time. Uh, so it's, it's yeah, I mean, you know, having the extensions as a map is fine because we don't know what those are ahead of time, but the things like the ID, source, spec, version, et cetera, those should be um, well-defined names. Right. Yeah, that was my thinking because uh, it, it just seemed more natural to me as well. Um, yeah. But thank you for the thumbs up on that. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, the, the um, if you had, a, you know, if we had, a, you know, let's say version two as a new required field, you know, we would drop it in somebody that still had the version one, their protocol buffer would parse because uh, uh, new fields that aren't known are just dropped. Um, yeah. So it, well, wouldn't, actually, it wouldn't be breaking unless you removed a field. I thought in Proso 3 now the changes were made so we didn't, you don't drop unknown fields or is that still a configuration option? I think it's a configuration option. Um, there are, I think there, there's a difference on whether unknown fields are made available to you as part of the reflection structure or not. Right. Um, no, I, so I, I, yeah, I was going to say, I, cause we were using uh, PayPal, we were using proto two and switch to three. Um, and I think we were one of the, you know, band of people that was pushing for the, you know, the unknown fields to, to be put back in, you know, cause it, it was something that changed between two and three. And I thought that was becoming the default behavior rather than a configured behavior. But okay, um, it, it I, Jeff, I'm not I'm not well versed in the depths of Proto. So. <laughs> it it did raise another interesting question for me though whether these schemas themselves need to be versioned. Yeah. So the the name spacing on the, um, not just the Java package, but probably the um, Proto itself probably needs to be, include a, you know, a V1 marker, you know, so that we can support multiple versions side by side if they change dramatically. But that was another tweak. Okay, uh, Clemens, did you wanna say something? You came off mute. Yeah, the, I think the lengthy discussion that we had about bags is coming back here. Um, because the, the, we have this, we used to have this extension, extension bucket, um, that housed the extensions. And then we went back to, uh, making everything a flat list. And this, this brings back the extension bucket, which has the, with the consequence that if a, um, if there's no uneven support on either ends of um, you know, there's a there's a cloud event publisher and the cloud event publisher gives you a um, is you know has a new well-known property so you know a version 1.2 or version 2 there is an intermediary which has the old um, um, knows the 1.0 schema and then there's a receiver on the other end which knows the 2.0 schema then the 2.0 the publisher would use the 2.0 proto, proto schema, would then publish to the intermediary, which is using 1.0 schema. 
um, and then uh, would probably go and drop the extra attribute on the floor because that's now sitting at the at the at the at the outer level, um, and uh, the the two O receiver would not get it. That would be a new version of this schema, though, wouldn't it? If it's version two, yes. Or so you're saying are you saying you add a new I don't know optional attribute? Is that your concern? Yeah, so with with the with with what we did with Avro, where we're where we're against the against the spirit of Avro, um, are actually using maps and tagged um, um, uh, tagged attributes. Right. Um, you can add a field, and that that field will pass through um, the 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 intermediary because it doesn't know it doesn't need to know about an extra field. Uh, here, if you're making the fields our our attributes first class, right? If you're adding a first class element, so you're adding after subject or after time, you're adding now, uh, you know, the next one then an intermediary, which only understands this schema, will basically go and, and read the proto event, will ignore what's at whatever was extra. Um, you will have a deserialized object now, which, has, which doesn't have that extra information. And whatever you want to pass on to the, the next party um, will miss that extra information that the, the client submitted because the, the serializer will ignore it. So the, the old the old intermediary will ignore it. So I think there's a I know, I, and I think I may have mentioned this in the in the PR. There's a halfway house solution uh, where you formally declare the required attributes, you know, ID and source, but all the optional ones you just leave in in the in the map. Yeah, I think that yes. that it, it grates on me a little bit, but I I think that's that's a neater solve to that. Uh, and I think that would then address your, your concern. Yeah, I, I believe that's true because the, we cannot add in any future version, we cannot add anything that's required. Right, yeah. So, uh, Jim, did you get, oh, sorry, Ryan, you go ahead and you raise your hand. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was just looking at the spec. Uh, and uh, it does say an intermediate should forward optional attributes. It's not required. Um, so that would comply um, with that. I think my, my broader question is, um, you know, Avro and Protobuf are, are solving, you know, the same or, or mostly overlapping problems. Um, should we employ the same model? It, it feels like this is deviating from the Avro, the, the implementation of Avro that we already have. So I, I wouldn't claim to be an expert in Avro. Um, the way I was interpreting that spec is that, um, you, from what perspective are you talking about? The, the fact of just having it as a map? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I so I mean, if we just made it a straight map, then you know it becomes a much more durable thing. Um, it. It just seemed odd, you know, when you have um, attributes that you know are required and want to be first class citizens, um, that it, it just sort of smelt better to me to define them. I mean, we define them in the JSON schema, yeah? Um, now, obviously, JSON schema is a bit loose because, you know, you can just add whatever you want. Um, so, but we did go to the lengths of actually formally defining those and defining which fields are required and so on. Um, so I, I think we already have a level of deviation, um, but a point taken, okay. So what would you, would you advocate for just a map or, or this, would you be happy with this sort of halfway house solution where we formally declare the required ones and put everything else in a map? Or, or is your comment more around just consistent? My, my, my comment is, is, is more about the whether we want consistency. I think you know there, there's trade-offs to to all the approaches, and it, and it's it's hard for me to, to give a hard and fast answer on the fly here. Um, um, I think you know doing that that halfway solution would comply to the spec, but I think it, it probably needs 
more thought as to the trade-offs. Um, but yeah, I, I was commenting more to the, should we, um, and I'm not saying we should or shouldn't, it's just raising the question, do we want um, consistency across the different you know, representations or the different uh, ways of, of serializing cloud events? Um, I I'm sorry, let, uh, let me shut up and let the other people speak. Lots of hands up. Actually, I think Mike's hand, your hand is old, Mike, isn't it? I think, yeah, I think his, his oh, is old, so you're, you're free to go. So I was going to say, I mean, I wonder if there are echoes here of some of the SDK work. Now, I, I've not been involved in that a lot, um, but I think there was an attempt to sort of have a consistent programming model uh, for the SDKs. Um, and what those groups discovered over time was that, you know, when you do that, you lose some of the, you know, the idiomatic nature of the languages that you're working in. So, you know, they, they've naturally sort of, you know, gone their own way um, and made them much more language centric. Um, so I, I don't know, but I suspect having explicit um, attributes like that probably is more efficient, you know, on the wire and from a decoding perspective. Um, yeah, okay. I, I, I'll change the spec to the model of, uh, you know, uh, required and all the optional stuff in a map and we can readdress it. I do have a question maybe for Clemens. Can you comment on the timestamping? I was going to ask about that, yeah. yeah. Um. So it's in the cloud event spec itself. I don't know if you want to jump over to that, Doug. Uh, it explicitly says it's a stream. So am I breaking the spirit of a um, a spirit of a cloud event by saying I want to put it in a you know in a in a essentially a timestamp binary field the um the uh um i didn't think that was, i didn't think that meant yeah, you had to encode it as a string so, so oh. it's it's only so so the the um if you just at the top of this of this of this uh, page no, no 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 stop this specification so type system right each of these types may be represented differently by different event formats and protocol metadata fields. So you're okay, right? What this specification does is it defines a canonical string encoding for each type that must be supported by all implementations. So if you represent this as a string, then it must be this. That's what that means. Excellent. So I should have just read the document. Okay. <laughs> yes. It, it, is okay a fairly, it, it, it is at times a fairly dense uh, write-up. It's a, it's a nice piece of work, Clemens. Come on. No, no. But pat, ourselves, all, pat ourselves on the back. <laughs> that we, that we, exactly. That we all jointly created. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Running a little low on time here, unless it, unless there's something really major relative to um, the protobuf PR, I'd like to move on if that's okay. I, well, else? so I Thanks. do want to ask the comment around uh, gRPC. Yeah. So oh, yeah. Is that a transport spec. It's a protocol. Okay. It's a protocol, yeah. It's not a transport. What? What? what which? GRPC. Oh, I mean, we're talking about protocol so bindings. Once, yeah, so once, we, binding. so once we've defined, assuming we can agree on what a proto format looks like, yeah, um, theoretically then we could define GRPC bindings which allowed for not just proto formats but other, you know, uh, event formats to be exchanged as well yeah. and so the question is where would that go or is it is it just in a world of its own um from a, a spec perspective so grpc is going to be interesting because it's grpc is arguably an overlay over uh well it is actually an overlay over hdp2 yep um and um it defines a way how to well do rpc things so it's going to be it's going to be interesting how we can go and define something that is, is for cloud events that's not too constraining. 
that is not just a proto definition because ultimately right. I, because ultimately you're you're passing a data structure as an argument for a function right yep and um um we're also we're also obviously struggling with the, the where now we're having the same struggle in this project as um, as exists across the the rest of CNCF in that everybody is using gRPC which is a CNCF project and then um, but by default using protobuf which is a Google project <laughs> not looking so, at anybody in particular <laughs> so it, it, it's your comment there that we should stay away from it or you don't see it as something this group should um sh should define um, or, or it's just a new type of protocol binding that we haven't seen before um i think it's a i think it's i think it's reasonable to go in and do a, a, a grpc binding right but by our rules um arguably the protobuf the protobuf binding should be probably be part of a grpc binding because that's the context in which it's arguably only permissible because because of the the um, proprietary nature of protobuf um, as it stands if we want to go and, and play play the police on on per our rules um so yeah i think i think it makes i think it makes sense to to have a grpc binding i'm just wondering what the whether there is a reasonably generic way to create a gRPC binding for this. Um, if I may, yeah, uh, go for it. Reg regarding the protobuf, um, I, I want to say that, um, I mean, there's quite some usage of protobuf outside of gRPC ecosystem. And I think if we split into the protobuf definition of the cloud event, uh, so the definition itself and some gRPC efforts, uh, will in my opinion, it would be better because people will come and ask for a uh, protobuf definition of cloud event, not gRPC uh, related stuff, but just protobuf. That's the first comment I, I wanted to make. And uh, another one kind of related is that we, uh, by we, I mean uh, some forces at uh, Pivotal and now VioWare, uh, we're trying to kickstart the conversation about cloud events streaming. And uh, I'm also referring to the Liquid project uh, that I made and later we started using Project Brief, where we tried to generalize um, subscri publish subscribe uh, semantics, Kafka-like semantics uh, described in gRPC. And uh, we may also continue the conversation by merging two because uh, that's something else we're trying to discuss as well. Like focus on cloud events streaming. Focus on cloud events streaming. So, Jem, could, could you make it real quick? I mean, you, you have the last uh, yeah. statement. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. I mean, I think protobuf, need, the, the format needs to be kept separate from the yeah. GRPC document because you know, we can send these formats over any transport. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to put a GRPC you know, proposal together, um, uh, but I'd rather wait until we've got this one to mm. bed before we do that. Okay. And with that, we only have five minutes left. And what I wanted to do, I had another topic on the agenda, but I'd actually think I'm saving that. What I'd rather do is put Klaus on the spot because he just opened this one an hour ago. Um, Klaus, you want to introduce this one? Because I think this is going to be an interesting topic that may warrant some yes. deep discussion. I want to bring it up sooner rather than later. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I intentionally put in the, the work in progress in the title um, yeah. because uh, it's, I think it's also depending on other changes that will happen uh, before. So it's uh, right now it's the change in the event provider and I suppose it will be probably changed to service or something. But um, uh, the idea I, I had, and I think it uh, was already brought up, I think by Mike or someone uh, in the original uh, Google doc we had, there was, I think, uh, a source pattern uh, field. Um, I did some research on existing uh, concepts, like what you know probably from OpenAPI. And those seem to be um, based on uh, this RFC I'm referencing here for, for um, URI templates. And so um, that's the, the idea of a proposal to have an optional field that would then 
uh, describe the uh, template for how a source field for a certain service would look like then. So one example I came up with is this simple example here in the bottom. There are of course a few things you, you might uh, discuss here if, if this template format is the right one or um, this, uh, if you look at that RFC, it's also defining certain levels of uh, complexity, I would say, for templates. If you if we should restrict it to a certain level, uh, in my opinion, in most cases, even level one would be sufficient. So those are things we, we might discuss or if it's people think it's useful at all. The reason I think this is going to be really interesting is because I think this is going to help shape the uh, how much automation we'll be able to have, right? Versus have to do user input to get things going. And, and the, you know, once you have this, the next question I would have is, okay, how do people know what bucket means, right? Do we need some sort of schema or something that helps define what actually, what, what yeah. these fields actually mean? And that, that's going to be even more interesting. So I, I want to get this conversation going because I think this is going to be a good one. Yeah, so that's of course a, a big question. If you look at uh, other standards like Open API or Async API, they have their own, uh, um, sub objects for parameters and, and uh, quite a um, big, or, or, well, a lot of ways you can define those parameters. Yep. Okay, with about a minute we have left. Any quick questions for Klaus? Okay, in that case, um, like I said, I did want to talk about this, but I, I'll save that for next week because I think I, have an, I might need to write something up to better express what I was thinking that with those, with those questions. Um, any other topics you want to bring up before I go back and do final roll call? All right, thank you everybody. Uh, Curtis, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hello. Excellent. Hello. Uh, Paris, are you there? Paris? Okay, what about Grant? Yeah, I'm here. All right, cool. Did I miss anybody? I'm sorry. This is Paris Lucas. I wasn't near. Not, not a problem. The phone. Uh, do me a favor. I'm not sure I have you in the attendee list yet. Can you just either in the Zoom chat or someplace like in this, um, the meeting minutes, just give your last name and any company affiliation you like to be associated with? Um, the last name is Lucas, L-U-C-A-S, and okay. Red Hat. Ah, I can spell Red Hat. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Anybody else I missed? All right, in that case, I believe this part of the call is done. We'll start up the SDK call in about a minute or two. Just give everybody a chance to get settled or hit the facility if they need to. All right, thank you, everybody. We'll talk next week. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks, bye. Thank you, have a good day. Yep, bye. While we're waiting, do we actually have any agenda items? Wait a minute, what happened? Did I mess up? Didn't we talk last week? Shouldn't this be like the 21st? Yeah. I could have sworn we talked last week. Yeah. Anyway, no big deal. <clears throat> do we have any uh, items for the agenda? I might expect a discussion of the TypeScript repo. Oh, we can talk about that. I think we resolved that, but hopefully we can talk, we'll talk about that. Anything else? Uh, both JavaScript and uh, Golang went 2.0 last, yesterday. Cool. Anything else? Yeah, we can talk about uh, the Python SDK. Um, maybe yeah. looking for your viewers. Okay. All right, give another 30 seconds or so and then we'll get started. Do, 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 do.
let's go ahead and do this thing. All right, TypeScript repo. Um, so Lance, correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, and actually, I guess Grant too, since you're on. I believe the current state is technically we agreed that as of right now, we do not need it. And everybody's going to try to do everything within the JavaScript repo. Um, I believe I did get permission from Grant to go ahead and delete it. However, I decided to hold off on doing that. Instead, I archived it just because I didn't want to delete any issues or PRs that may be there. I figured it's easy to delete again later, but at least it is archived, so no work should go on there. Um, is that a fair summary, Grant and Lance? So I think that was an accurate summary up until maybe t yesterday morning. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, there is an issue with um, type definitions that we're generating, not really, um, not really understanding certain JS doc syntax and, and outputting something that's incorrect. So as a result, there's a, um, uh, we're going to move forward with, you know, um, adding TypeScript to the existing repository. Uh, but I would say we still do not need uh, the TypeScript repo that was discussed before. Okay. Does that make sense? Well, I, <laughs> I'm trying. It sounds like the net of it is still what I said, even though some of the details under the covers may be different. Is that fair? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, well, yes. The the specifics of, for example, having to uh, constantly run a build, which was not the case in the. Um, in the sort of alternative that I presented and that landed um, will now need to be the case. But it, those are just details. Like, yeah. I think I think the, the net result is we don't need a TypeScript um, repository specifically, and we're taking steps to make TypeScript developers happy in the current repository. Grant, would you say that's fair? Yeah, it's not that great. Um, yeah, I think uh, I mean, with the uh, with the changes, we're really just trying to get TypeScript support, and I think there's um, if if it's possible uh, to just I mean, uh, to generate the TypeScript um, bindings, we need to by itself uh, using TypeScript files. Just to generate the TypeScript binding sounds great. Um, and I'm yeah, looking forward to uh, being able to use TypeScript. Okay. So as I said, I, I, I'll keep it around the repo just in case something happens and we don't want to lose the, I think I mean, the one issue or one PR that's, oops, sorry, go ahead, Grant. I, like, uh, I, don't think it's worth keeping the repo. I mean, there's, I, I don't know. I think I had the one PR, and so if there's, I mean, I don't see any reason. I already copied the, um, a GitHub issue into the JavaScript repo, and so it's, uh, it's all good for deletion oh. from my perspective. Okay, I will do it then. No need to be cautious. Okay, cool. Thank you. Any other comments, questions on that issue or that topic? All right. Anybody want to talk about the V2 deliverables? Ooh. Scott. Yeah, looking, well, for Go, we're looking for feedback and usage and people finding bugs and issues. It's um, with, with the uh, major version 2.0, we're going to go back to adhering to strict Semver protocols and versioning and, and fun times. Yep, that's exciting. There's a couple breaking changes from the previews and the RCs um, because we, we, at the last minute, decided to ship all the, uh, the protocol implementations as sub-modules. So some things got um, bumped to a different uh, import path, but the code is the same. Now, earlier, was it this week or last week, you mentioned a possible uh, hiccup with the GoMod stuff where we need separate repos. Is that issue behind us now? 
Yeah, I worked around it. There's some automation that needs to be written to help make releases happen a little easier, but basically like I go to the Go mod community and I'm like, yo, I, I want to make sub releases in Go modules for sub modules. And they're like, yeah, don't do that. That's, that's scary. <laughs> and, and so it turns out that the documentation for all this stuff is in Go files in an internal full package inside of the Go lang. Uh, which I don't understand, and it's not published anywhere, which is also fun. So basically, it's like GoMod is highly undocumented, and people are unwilling to go and actually understand how it works. Shocking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any questions about the uh, V2 releases? All right. In that case, Python SDK. Who wants to lead that one? Yeah, so I was taking a look at one of the issues published. Um, I'm kind of new to the SDK, but they, there was an issue regarding it not being very Pythonic. So right now I'm currently creating a class inside of the SDK um, directory such that you don't have to do all this overhead of having to manually create um, various marshals and stuff. So just making that entire interface much nicer. Uh, right now, it's mostly done. I had just, I changed some of the internal um, classes. So I'm currently trying to get the other previous tests to um, pass. So I can post a link, I guess, to the fork that I'm working on somewhere. I don't know how this is documented usually. So uh, yeah. just a, who, who's the maintainer of Python? I can't remember. Who do we have over there? Um, I'm unsure. I don't think. Uh, Dustin. I don't know. Dustin. Yes, yeah, so I want to make sure that you, think... you. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, well, that's a good question, and I don't know if we know the answer. Um, I. Does anybody know a Dennis Matogon? I want to say he might have been from Oracle. That may be wrong. Yes, it says. Yeah, Oracle. I mean, there's, there's only 30 something commits on the repo. Mm -hmm. uh, and looks like he's the primary developer since the uh, your initial commit in September. Of yep. Years ago, I guess. Um, and so I don't think there's any. But he primarily working on this repo right now. Okay. I, I suppose okay. that's one of the issues. Like uh, in terms of uh, our review process and developer process, getting some feedback from other folks that might be interested in using Python. Um, yeah. As far as I'm wondering, more, the, this repo is broken. Like the, the V2, uh, the, the V1 SDK implementation is incompatible with the spec. Gotcha. So I can take a look at that. Uh, can so, someone, I guess, links to the current, what you guys want for headers and stuff? Or somewhere? What you guys want for headers and stuff? I, I think I wrote an issue for it. I wrote an issue for it. All right, yeah, I'll take a look. Um, yeah, take a look. I was just currently uh, working on the wrapper uh, issue, uh, so I didn't see all the other issues. Uh, did you, Curtis, did you mean to mute yourself? Oh, um, yeah, I, I'm echoing, so that's why I was. Yeah. Actually, Grant, I, I think it might have been coming from Grant, so try again. He's, he's muted now. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, I haven't I hadn't gotten a chance to look at all the issues. I was currently just looking at the Pythonic one because that was one of the older things, and that seemed like a good place for me to start. Uh, but I can definitely um, look at you know what's broken with the support. Which issue was that exactly? Was that using extensions with Dictis? Yeah, that's right. Thirty-two. Okay. That's gotcha. the only thing that prevents this out of the box from working at the moment. Uh, so yeah, I will. I think I. Might have. So Curtis, um, are you are you planning on taking a very active role in this SDK? 
Yeah, um, I planned on more or less, like right now on my branch, it has an out of the box. You can just create a Flask server and use events to emit and stuff. Um, so I had gotten that at least working to a um, decent amount. So I can work on this like over the summer while I'm here. Okay, because it sounds to me like we, we really need somebody to own this puppy going forward because I don't think we have anybody else very active. And I'd yeah. love it if you, if you would like to you know, volunteer for that and then you know, we can make you a maintainer and all the other good stuff. Because when we, we say it again, are are you an intern, Curtis? Yeah, I'm an intern at the moment. Oh, cool. Where are you interning? Um, I'm in New York, and I was on the Cloud Run team. So yeah, yeah, neat, awesome. So you're a Googler then? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> Googler. <laughs> Googler, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, but yeah, I'll definitely I'll post um. Some links, I guess, to my forts, and I'll look at the other issues, uh, soon one at a time. <laughs> okay. But so noted. Yeah. yeah so from a, from, a, from a process question, I, it doesn't sound like anybody can identify anybody who's actually really active on this SDK. Is that correct? Yeah. So to my knowledge, um, Grant had told me that my point of contact would likely end up being, um, I think his name's Dustin Ingram. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we have a meeting with him on Friday. So I was gonna use that to capitalize and get more knowledge on you know things I don't know that I don't know. Okay, cool. Because the the reason I'm asking is more from a process related question. Because obviously you it'd be great. Obviously you open up PRs, review these issues, and do all the great work. But um, if either Dustin's not there or Dennis isn't going to be there to review your PRs, then that's a problem, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and so we so we need to think about making you a maintainer, and mm -hmm. I don't think that's a problem because we. We will make people maintainers if there's no one else in the group to to say yes or no, right? Because we need somebody. Um, mm -hmm. But I just want to make sure that we're not going to be stepping on someone else's toes. If, for example, Dustin is actually very active and we just don't realize it. Yeah, gotcha. So, as Grant said before, the last commit was in like April 27th. Um, so it, it's a little inactive, but definitely like you know, it would be nice to have another person to get PRs done in a timely fashion. Yeah, so let me know how the conversation with Dustin goes and see whether he's planning on actually being active or not. That'd be helpful. All right, cool. Yeah. Um, so just for context, um, so I'm I'm going to be working with Paris. Paris joined recently. Google and um, yeah. So our plan is, uh, if it's okay, uh, to improve the Python SDK um, over the summer, and uh, we'll be. Uh, Chris will be sending me PRs, and um, anybody that's really interested uh, can be involved too. But uh, yeah, it'll be me, Curtis, um, Dustin, since he's in Python um, and interested in the SDK. Okay, cool. Sounds great. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> All right. Uh, anything else for the agenda today? Could be a very short call. Going once. All right. We are done then. Thank you, everybody. And we'll talk again next week. Have a good rest of your week. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye